Amen. <laughs> uh, we, we have such a great band. It's really, it's just so cool. So anyway, thanks you guys. Hey, uh, this, I'm not preaching this week. In weeks that I don't preach, people will often um, say, so Peter, you got the week off, you know, like I don't have anything else to do. I don't, but, and uh, that's, no, that's not true. What I, did, what I do on weeks that I don't preach is I work on uh, space-time technology. And, uh, and, and I've developed a, a, a space-time uh, warp system that we're going to initiate now. And I know that's hard to believe, but you just need to kind of go with it, okay? Um, and w- what we're planning to do is we're, t- we're planning to time warp in. Now, I don't think this person can see us, but, but we can see them. We're trying to time warp in to Rome uh, around the 6th or 7th century A.D., and we're just gonna, we're gonna try to spy on somebody, okay? If you have ethical issues with that, you know, just let it go. God will forgive you. Um, but we're gonna spy on a guy named Saul of Tarsus, and uh, he's uh, actually in prison. You probably know him better as uh, Paul, St. Saint, Saint Paul, all right? So we'll do a countdown together, and I'll initiate the time warp, all right? Ready? Uh, at the count of three, you all count together with me. Ready? One two, three. (laughs) Hey, uh, Timothy, it's good to see you. Uh, No, (laughs) I won't get up. yeah, did you, um, did you meet Rufus on the way in there? Yeah, he's that big scary guy. <laughs> uh, he's my new guard. Don't worry about him. He's actually a big teddy bear. It's been kind of fun getting to know him. He's been, um, he and I have been talking when nobody's around, and he just, he just can't get his head around this idea that there's just one God. But to be honest with you, I don't even get his head around that, this idea that there's a lot of gods, so... Yeah, I've, I've liked talking to him. Hey, Timothy, I'm so glad you've come. And, but I'm, 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 working on, I'm working on trying to write this letter, you know, to our friends over in Philippi. And they're having some problems. Um, anyhow, I, I'm, I'm almost done, but I was wondering, I'm, I'm going to kind of show you what I've written and read it to you. And, Maybe you can give me some, some ideas or tell me what you think. I start this way in this part of the letter. I, say, I, I, I said, uh, finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, it's, it's no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. No, I, I don't think that's a little too much. Um, do you remember? You, you think this is harsh. Do you remember what I wrote to our friends over in Galatia? Remember how I, I said, hey, if you're going to be people who think, you know, taking a quarter inch of skin off is what's going to make you right with God, well, go ahead and castrate yourselves. <laughs> yeah, that's what I told them. I wrote it down. So, I don't know, Timothy, we can't, we can't overemphasize how wrong, how wrong people are getting this story. You see, we, we are the circumcision, this is what I'm telling them, we're the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Timothy, we're not... We're not known, we're, 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 we don't belong to God because we have, because we're circumcised. Whether it's the guys or, or the gals who hang out with the guys or the sisters or the brothers of those who've been circumcised, that's not what makes us now known as the people of God, Timothy. It's, it's because we worship in truth through Jesus. And it has nothing to do, it has nothing to do with our flesh. 
Now, hang with me for a minute. Let's say it did. And let's say, this is what I'm trying to tell them, let's say that they're coming up with those people who seem very smart and who seem so spiritual, who keep telling them that, you know, you've got to love Jesus and... You see, I got a feeling that from now, for the next, you know, couple of years till Jesus comes back, that this and part, it could be endless. You could add anything you want. I got a hunch people will, but right now, they're saying that it's, it's this, it's like keeping the law. It's the same, it's just keeping the law. Keeping the rules. Love Jesus, yeah, trust Jesus, Jesus died for you, and just try real hard. That's what'll give you, you know, the ability to interact with the Spirit of God. But let's say, let's just say, back to that. Let's, let's say that is how it worked. Let me tell them, I'm gonna tell them my story. See though, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. I mean, if somebody's gonna have, you know, the ability to sort of be the best, here's my story. If anyone thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, but not just that, but see, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I became a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church and to righteousness under the law. No one could find anything that I had violated. I'm blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Here's the weird thing. You, you, you know what happened that day, you, you know what happened that day on that road. That day when from one side of the story I lost everything. I, 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 I lost all my credibility. As a, as a teacher, as a Pharisee, as a leader. Timothy, I lost my family. I didn't even have a good way to make money anymore. I had to go back to fixing tents. I lost everything, but I gained everything. And here's what I found out, is as I've, if I, as I've, I've relived that moment that the more I tried to be righteous, the more trapped I became. And in that moment when I know, I know I met Jesus, it was the first time I had ever been free. It was the first time I quit trying. I quit trying to tell others and even tell God, look how good I am. Deep down inside, I knew I wasn't. No matter what they said, no matter how many people liked me, I knew it wasn't true. I knew it wasn't true. I count everything as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Like there's, there's not a, I don't even think you can compare it. <sighs> for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish. Yeah, that's right, a poop pile in order that I can gain Christ and be found in him, not having, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law because I know deep inside I was never gonna be good enough. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that, that depends not on my striving, Timothy. Our friends at Philippi have got to stop believing that they have to work harder and harder and harder, but in fact by faith, but in fact by releasing that, by not striving, by surrendering, they'll be free. That I can know him and the power of his resurrections and I can share in his sufferings and I become like him in his death and by any means possible. I can attain the resurrection from the dead. 
Timothy, are, you, you, you're a young guy now. Maybe you know now, but Timothy, as, as you continue to, to lead and shepherd and love your friends there in Ephesus, Timothy, you, you're going to find, if you listen long enough and carefully enough, in almost every story of discouragement and giving up is a story of somebody who's become tired of trying, who believes, somehow still believes, that they have to make it happen. Now, I, I, I've talked about some pretty lofty stuff. But I have to be honest with our friends in Philippi. Not that I have already obtained this or that I'm already perfect or that I've already got it all figured out. Timothy, this, this, this will happen to you. It happens to all leaders. You see, people think I'm better than I really am. I, I, I know so much more about loving God than I'm really able to do. I, I often find myself going back to a different way of thinking. I, every once in a while, I'll find myself sort of slipping into that, that little notion that, oh, I'm just not good enough. I haven't done enough. But you know what? I, I don't, as best I can, I try not to get stuck there. I'm not already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. That every day I try to own this idea that I'm loved because I'm loved. And if I'm righteous, it's only because he's gifted me that, and not because I tried to be, and he's made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. What do I mean by forgetting what lies behind? Well, it's, it's both the good and the bad. There are moments, Timothy, where if I'm going to be honest, I, I sort of miss being Saul. I, I, let this, I, I imagine the stories. I imagine when people, they were a little bit afraid of me, when people wanted to be close to me. Sure, I, I, I sometimes begin to think about when I had all kinds of clothes and, and now I'm almost always freezing. and had, I could eat anything I wanted. And now unless you or one of the brothers or sisters brings me some food. I got no food. I'm hungry. And sometimes I want to think that that was the good life. Or did I make a mistake? And then I just remembered it was a trap. I was never free. And sometimes I get stuck not remembering how good it was, but how bad I was. And the story that haunts me, the story that still sometimes will wake me, is the story you know about, it's the story everybody knows about. It's, it was about that lovely young man, Stephen. I can't I can't tell you how often I'm tempted to wallow in the shame that I, I, I was gaining status. I, I was seen as the real persecutor, the real righteous one, because I was willing to take the life of a young and clearly innocent young man. And I won't forget when I held those coats, and I nodded my head. And they knew it was okay to start throwing the rocks. I, I, Timothy, 
ultimately, if I've learned anything, it's when I rehearse the stories in my head, I will always end up with this conclusion. I'm not enough. I don't have it. Every time I want to sort of wallow in something in the past, it's always the same conclusion. The story will end with me, and I'm not good enough. I can't make it. Now, I was thinking the other day, I know you've heard this story. The, the, I've heard it from lots of our, our friends. Where it, was, it was this time when Jesus, they were talking about this time when Jesus and he was out teaching. He was teaching, like, this was like, he was, I think it was like his really important sermon, you know, this really important messages. And sometimes they would have all those people, remember? And so this one time, it was like 5,000 people or even more. And, and they were all listening to Jesus, and, and they'd been there all day. And, um, and so people started getting hungry, but nobody... Either they didn't bring their food or they weren't willing to say they had because they were afraid to share. I, I don't know. But there was something about everybody was hungry. And Jesus said, you know, hey, what do we, what do we have? And the little boy, you know, he stood up and said, hey, I got, I got some bread. I got a little fish. You know what I've been thinking about? And I, I haven't never noticed it before, but now I, I, I see that story. I, I, I think Jesus never... He never shamed them. He never said, what kind of stupid people are you? Why would you come for an all-day meeting with no food? He, he, he never said, let's talk about what you don't have. I keep hearing the words that they told me that he said when he said, what do you have? That's all you need. Whatever, what do you have? Whatever you have, I'll use that. I'll use that. Don't worry about what you don't have. Don't worry that you don't have reputation anymore. Don't worry that you have no financial resources. Don't worry that you can't even take care of yourself. What do you have? For me, I have that I know I'm free. I know, I know that I've been rescued. And it's weird, but nothing good comes from me overthinking it. I forget what lies behind and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So let those of us who mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will show you. God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we've attained, to what we know to be true. Brothers, join. This one's a little hard, and it could be misunderstood, but Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. And Timothy, the example that I want them to follow is not of, of me, their friend, the, the one who has loved them and introduced them to Jesus and helped them begin their own little families, their own little churches. What I want them to imitate is that I've forgotten it all. None of that matters. What I want them to imitate is simply that Jesus is calling me forward with what I have, what he's given me, and he's not shaming me ever for what I don't have. There's many of whom I've often told you now and tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Timothy, some of the scariest people, 
some of the people that can do the most damage to the soul of a person would be those who say they love Jesus, the same Jesus we love. How do you, how do you know, how do you know? Timothy, always, always, always let your people know if they ever hear love Jesus and to pay close attention because that could be someone who could lead them astray. You see, Timothy, they don't know it and it doesn't look like it on the surface but their end is destruction Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. You see, they will will find credibility in the very same things that people who don't even know Jesus find credibility in. They'll talk about how, how many people follow them, how many likes they've gotten, how many views they get. They will, they will, find their credibility and their status and how much money they have. Get our head, let's get our head around this, that, that, that Jesus, who had nothing, and we all say we love him. They all say they're going to love him. And yet, the only difference will be that while Jesus had nothing, they are supposed to be more special to God because they're rich or they've been successful? It makes no sense. You see, <laughs> we don't belong here. We, we're visiting here. Our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. You know, I meant it. I meant it when I wrote to our other friends that it, it, it's, it's by the power of Jesus' words that everything works. That Jesus makes it all work. He, he, the, the stars and the sun doesn't fall out of the sky and, and the, the seas don't surround us and bury us. That it's all. Because Jesus subjected it all to himself. Because he's God. Because he's God. Ah, oh, Timothy, I got a little more work to do. But that's what I got so far. And I hope it helps them. Did you, um, did you, did you remember to bring a little wine and bread? Oh, oh I'm so glad you did. Oh, I, I can't tell you how I look forward to when we get to do that, um, that reenactment. When we get to, and I know it's been a long time, I mean, it's been, I think it's been, almost, I mean, it's been like 30 years since that night. But it, it, it feels like I can be there. I can be there with Jesus and, and our friends that were his friends. Oh, I love that uh, I can sit there and I can imagine I can imagine, I can imagine Jesus with such tenderness and love. Even, this is, blows me away, even with Judas right there. Judas! And how tenderly he loved you, Judas. And he said, I remember, I remember what everybody has told me that was there, what, what he said. That he, he, he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Yeah, yeah, we've, 
We've known what that's about, haven't we? And, and this is the blood that was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Oh, it's so marvelous. And thanks for, thanks for bringing the bread and the wine and for making this holy reenactment, this holy remembrance. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Because our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. <laughs>